Good evening and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Today we've got Doug Marks. Doug Marks is famous for. What well, would you say the the ads first started coming out in the magazines that all us rockers know? My first ad came out in 1982. Okay, so it's been a couple of years, two three years, in a hot minute. That's the kids would say. Uh, <laughs> gee, I, <laughs> two three years. I like, guess it's only me. been like four decades. Four decades. Come on, it's like yesterday. There's some of us. <laughs> really, I don't remember what happened yesterday, but I remember that. I remember your stuff better than I do my other stuff. D Doug had was famous for his guitar instruction, which I can't tell how many people have, have done it or taken it. I mean, you've by the numbers, but I mean, it's but it's pretty huge. And whereas we were talking, the internet's changed, but you were one of the innovators of reaching out to get your, your clients, not just through like regular classes, but you were actually advertised for a magazine and you do doing cassettes. Right, and then how did it change? Uh, started out, uh, right? started out with audio cassette, yes. And and obviously it's changed now to the web, and you have obviously more competition. But you are one of the originals, and you still you still jam. And I want people to check you out. Um, but let's roll back just a little bit. When you started out, what got you going into starting to do the ads to, to really put it out there? Because you were the first person to do it. Like, where did you get that idea from? Well, I read the fan magazines and there weren't that I remember any other guitar magazines other than guitar, you know, the original guitar player, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I began by advertising in the fan scenes like Hit Parader, Cream, that elk. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the reason that I did it, I was giving guitar lessons in Denver for a couple of years. Uh, that was my first experience teaching guitar. And my students loved what I was doing. They loved how I taught. And they were telling me they had seen an ad or two in the magazines advertising guitar lessons. And they were at the time Starlicks, Arlen Roth. That's right. So uh, there were two before me, but they had their niche, which was quite different than what I intended to, you know, which was a hard rock, heavy metal uh, course. Anyway, my students convinced me, uh, why not take a chance? Uh, I was on my way out of Denver at the time, moving to Los Angeles. I put together some materials. Uh, my students, uh, they were the first people that bought my course, actually. <laughs> it was right. a very primitive course at the time, but I made six, $700 on my way out of Denver uh, going to Los Angeles. And I thought, you know, this just might work. And I, I was aware of what they were telling me. I looked in the magazines, I saw the competitions and, and such. So I decided why not put my own course together. I didn't have much money at the time. I mean, I really basically had nothing. Uh, I was uh, married uh, to my ex-wife uh, and she helped me get the business started. I had two uh, vintage guitars, a couple Stratocasters, actually. And they were the type of guitars that I had told myself under no circumstance will I ever part with these guitars. But I decided to do my own version of the Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar, you know, setting it on fire as a sacrifice, right? Uh, so I thought, okay, I will start my business with this sacrifice of selling these two guitars. I used the money that I got to buy a couple of ads in the magazines. I mean, right now you run an ad on the internet, it appears immediately. Right. When I did this in the magazine, it took a couple months for them to show up in the wow. magazines. So not only did I have to have the confidence in what I was doing, but it's like two months before I get any money back at all. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make this quick because it was quite an experience. I mean, basically what happened is two months came a lot faster than I thought. And eventually I decided, well, I better start working on this course. <laughs> so, oh, you didn't have anything totally set up? You just no, put the ad in with that? Oh, no. wow. They were the motivators for me to do it. If I didn't have this pressure of these people had actually <laughs> sent me money and they were ordering my courses and I had absolutely nothing, if that wasn't the case, I might have said, eh, it was a great idea, Doug, but let's not right. go down that path. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, so when the money started flowing in, I didn't have a course yet. So the first thing I did was write excuse letters. 
And I became very good at writing excuse letters. And I, I pleaded with them, if you want your money back, I understand. Uh, my course is not ready, but I promise if you wait for me, it's going to be really, really good. It might be another couple months. And it was. Eventually, I did finish it. I fulfilled all the orders. Nobody wanted their money back. Really? Uh, everybody loved the course right from the beginning. At the time, my ex-wife and I were living in a, uh, not even a one bedroom. It was just like, you know, a, whatever you call them, a bachelor pad or something like, like a that. Studio, like a studio thing? Yes, a, a, yeah. a studio. And what, uh, one room, I mean, when you're in this room, you see the kitchen area. I mean, it's very, very tiny, tiny. It was like $300 a month. Of course, this was 40 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, I went from that to a three-story house in Woodland Hills, making $100,000, over $100,000 a year later. Wow. <laughs> so it was a pretty good idea that took off immediately. People did love my stuff. And uh, I have had many, many successful years, especially the magazine years, which lasted 25 to 30 years. Yeah. Uh, full page ads, you know, rel relentlessly every single month for years and years and years and years and years. Yeah, I remember seeing. I mean, I, I can't remember not seeing you and reading those magazines. You were in it as much as everybody else. Almost like um, by proxy, you became as famous as everybody else because you were in it as much. I did, another guitar player with it, you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> you're just right I, with these guys, I, I, you know? I, I, do, I absolutely do know. I, it's been quite an experience. And of course, it's always interesting when someone recognizes me and all that type of thing. Or I hear a story about Eddie Van Halen was not real happy with the fact that I did a lesson on eruption. I tried to avoid copyright infringement by instead of teaching it from beginning to end, I taught mm -hmm. it from end to beginning. And apparently he caught wind of it because many, many years later when I was uh, advertising in Guitar World magazine and it was an Eddie Van Halen special, uh, my ad rep told me that uh, Eddie said, He's not going to advertise in the magazine, is he? And they said, hey, he's one of our advertisers. Of course he is. So <laughs> I must have rubbed the guy the wrong way. Oh, wow. Uh, at the same story. time. Yeah, but, but uh, always been a fan of his. Uh, still am. I mean, he's, he was an amazing. Right. Um, I actually, I, I saw his last concert at the Hollywood Bowl. Did you actually start doing, as, as the advent of VHS tapes were out, did you start doing like VHS tapes too? Oh, yeah. Okay, started I VHS. Because... It, okay, so I started audio cassette in 82. Uh, 86, I started doing my first VHS tapes. Um, I called it uh, classic metal. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Zeppelin, Dokken, uh, Guns N' Roses, Hendrix. Anyway, I, I did it all legally, uh, got the rights, uh, cost quite a bit of money. So it was a short-lived experience. But anyway, that's where I started, 86. And I didn't actually put my course onto video until 88. And uh, the course that I did was basically, I took what I did in 82 and just did a video version of it, same material and everything, not even much of a revision. But, but uh, that was uh, uh, moving on to that media. I mean, I've basically been in that. And then I went on to, uh, to DVDs. Yeah. I have some stuff on CDs. Currently, I do digital downloads. Uh, my lessons can be streamed. So, uh, just like Howard Stern, I, I am the, I am the true king of all media. I, you. you know, I've done it all as far as well. A Doug, a Doug Marks eight track uh, <laughs> first course. I, 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 I didn't do probably. the. I, I didn't do the eight track. Yeah, that that was. Even before my time, be <laughs> for hilarious. my lessons, that would be hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, now you still do. You have, you have a great uh, website, and you still you actually have a lot of people teaching too. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Michelangelo Vadio. Yeah. Uh, for those that don't know Michael, just Google him. <laughs> he he has I don't know how many million views of his song No Boundaries. Uh, on our video channel on your site though how do you how are you breaking it down now as far as because you were the one big person doing it for years and as you've evolved 
the courses and stuff are you taking a full on like breaking the courses down differently now are you like how are you doing it now the formatting with different teachers well everybody has their own thing and uh we compartmentalize pretty well uh there's not a great deal of overlap uh our instructor uh dan mum does teach uh, neoclassic uh, neoclassical shred like michelangelo badio but there's certainly a difference in their uh teaching methods uh sarah spizak uh teaches uh She's all kinds of things from riffs to th theory. She's very good at teaching theory. Uh, Will Faraday is another instructor. Uh, DJ Nelson. Hope I didn't forget anybody. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's less promotion right at the moment. And this has just started in like the last six months of the other instructors. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's mainly Michael and myself right now. And Michael and me got together in, geez, I, I started doing his lessons in 91. So that would have been, you know, oh, wow. roughly a decade after I started. So he's been with me, I don't know, what, 30 years. And so that's what it was for a decade. It was like from 91 to 2000 or so. It was just Michael and myself. Then I expanded to the other instructors. What I have found over the past year is the other instructors weren't doing a lot to bring people in, you know, from all over the internet and such. Mm -hmm. Basically what was happening with the other instructors is they were taking um, our newsletter list and they were working their stuff on the newsletter list. But I really want people to bring New people. Uh, new people into the list instead of just taking the same thing and working it over and over again. Now, Michael brings in a ton of people. He at uh, four Pacific, I guess it would be like what? Uh, one. Yeah. One o'clock Eastern time on Thursday. He does a live stream for an hour and uh, oh, my God, he gets the numbers and uh, he, he brings a ton of people in. And I bring a lot of people in primarily because in the 80s and 90s, my lessons were extremely popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I was the only game in town. And uh, th especially when I was selling audio cassettes, they were very inexpensive. So the numbers were huge. Uh, I don't even know. I'm sure way over a million students, but I don't really have a number. But you could do the math over 40 years and especially 25 to 30 of those years advertising in the magazines that that uh, reached uh, guitar world at the time was reaching like 250,000 people every month so a lot of people almost almost all of the people that are studying my stuff right now are coming to me from they were they were aware of the course in the 80s mm -hmm. many of them were former students and a lot of people right now think, hey, he teaches kids and, you know, people in high. No, no, it's it's not that. It's like they were 16 then. They're 56 now. Yeah. This is my market. These are my people. They have grown up with me and they continue to buy my products. Breaking it down, like how it was decided. Because I mean, I, I think if you bring in more teachers, they should bring in their own demographics, their own people. Otherwise you're eating yourself alive. You're eating your own business. And, and, and that always hurt at that moment. It hurts in the long run. Cause people are like, I don't want to keep getting harassed or, you know, beating up by something. It, it, absolutely. I'm already, I'm already a part of it. I'm already on this list. You're just, now you're just, you know, it's becoming a spam and there's just so much competition and noise out there. Right. That it would, yeah, it would hurt you. Yeah. You know? But, but my demographics are really 45 to 65. Very, very strong in the middle of that range. Well, I'll tell you something else that's uh, very fulfilling for me is there are so many people in that age group that either they kind of started to do it when they were 16 years old and then life got in the way and they mm -hmm. had a family. Now they have a little bit more time on their hands. So there are many people that did it back then, put it down, and they're back with a vengeance. And there's also a large group of people that have never played guitar before that are starting now. 
And many think, oh, I'm too old. No, it's not a matter of your age. Yeah. It's a matter of how much available time. And a lot of people in that age group are starting to have available time just like they did when they were 16 years old. And so the money, a little more money. I didn't. I couldn't play. I just picked up a guitar five years ago. I was like 45, 46, just because I'm like, I want to play, you know? Yeah. So you can start, like, I, I agree. You can start, as long as you enjoy it, I'll be the best player alone in my bedroom <laughs> and have fun <laughs> forever. It's just going to have fun in, doing it. In February of this year, I decided I wanted to learn to play drums. Oh, nice. And, and I have never been a drummer. I have never even really been any good at, you know, keeping a basic beat or anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I stay on my guitar and I'll let others do that. But anyway, I, I decided... Well, a neighbor across the street, he had an electronic drum kit. And I wasn't going, he offered to loan it to me, and I wasn't going to take it unless I thought that I would actually practice it. I just didn't want to have something like that sitting in my garage. Right. So I finally said, okay, I'm ready to do it. I'm going to do it an hour a day for the next 30 days. We'll see where that takes me. And I just took off, you know, uh, really quickly after a month, I was good enough to play pretty decent drums, uh, you know, with album recordings and such. And now it's like, I don't know, four or five months later. And I'm a pretty damn good drummer. Let me tell you, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I went from this uh, crappy old set that my neighbor loaned me yeah. and I, I bought a $2,000 set wow. of real electronic drums that are just amazing that sound that's awesome crazy that is crazy that's awesome you and, did that though yeah and at the same time uh it's not that i did it because i want to play drums in a band i do a lot of recording and i want to be able to right. record uh, for my original music do the drums instead of you know copy and paste drum tracks and whatnot well that makes sense live drums are the most, i always say this they're the most important things when people and i'll say to people they, they record at home and stuff they do stuff you can do it and you can send the files back and forth but you need live drums you can do some electronic drums for some demos but please live drums live room drums people when they do music because it, it's so important you know yeah there are some apps that are very good right now like i use um uh what is it easy drummer three Easy Drummer 3, I guess is the name of it. Uh, it's an app that uh, is amazing. Is it? And it's pretty much indistinguishable from live drums, except uh, they're recorded by a really, re well, really good drummers in uh, awesome rooms. And uh, when I use those on recordings, it's virtually yeah. uh, indistinguishable. But what you were saying about, you know, uh, live drums. Yeah. Just it, it, in order to do anything in the rock world, you got to have killer drums. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have killer drums, uh, you, you're not going to be a very good band, no matter how good the other musicians are. So it all starts with the drums. Very, very important. It, it, you know, here's the thing. I'm sure there's a lot of really good electronic drums and a lot of kits out that you can get. And, and it's just like with the um, when you go to the grocery, you go to the store, and you can just kind of scan yourself out. Which is, it's good, it works. And that's the same thing with the kits, you know what I mean? But nothing mm -hmm. but like having a live person ring you through. I like the human connection. I think that's what I'm saying here. Oh, like yeah, there's, absolutely. There's something, I, if I see the, the scan throughs, I won't do them because I want a human being. I want people to work. I want people, I like the idea of having a band, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I probably couldn't tell the difference. If you did some stuff, I'd be like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm not going to say it's, you know, either. I'm not that guy either. Uh, right. Uh, you know, a real live drummer. Uh, we'll kick you ideas and you'll give, you know, it's, it, it's a whole different thing. And it, yeah, absolutely necessary. Well, one of the things that's great is I, besides inspiring is hearing that you just start playing drums and you've been a teacher for 40 years, which is super yeah. inspiring to people to be like, you, you're the perfect example. There's no, no age of when not to, you're not, yeah. you're not too good at one thing. Um, is now you're doing, you know, you've always been doing it. Let's talk about actually your original music. Because if I can okay. still write and you haven't stopped doing it. Right. But earlier on, you had Hawk. Uh huh. And there's some videos out there, some pretty fun videos. You have some great hair. You just had a. Oh, yeah. You, you had the image. I mean, it was, it was the, the name Hawk. It was just, it was fun. Um, and you had some good band members, but from what I gather, they were kind of more like um, people you put together, right? Was it as much of a band band? Well, the original group, 
uh, that played live. Although I found the members, I put them together. I paid for the rehearsals and, you know, it was my band, but it was a real band. Uh, we uh, traded ideas. I wasn't the only writer. Okay. However, the guys that were in the original band that you see on YouTube, uh, they were younger than me. And uh, it became difficult for me working with them because I was serious on a different level than most of them. Uh, not all of them. Uh, a couple ha went on to be in major groups. Uh, you may or may not know. Uh, the drummer was Scott Travis, and uh, he's been with uh, uh, Judas Priest for 35 so, years, basically. Yeah. It, either Judas Priest or Rob Halford. I mean, he's been with the, the same thing. He's phenomenal. A and he was amazing when I played with him. I, I mean, uh, he made our band uh, sound as great as we did at the time. Okay, then very quickly, after I left the band, I recorded my album. And that was a really solo project. Uh, I, I mean, the lead singer never even stepped foot in the studio. I recorded his uh, vocals at my house with a, a very high level eight track recording uh, uh, setup. Uh, and uh, Matt Sorum, Help me, uh, Matt Storm, Guns N' Roses, Roses yeah. The Cult, and so on and so forth. Uh, he helped me work out the parts on electronic drums. And then we went into the studio. He recorded the drum parts for the album while he was actually listening to the drums that we had recorded. Wow, very cool. That is cool. I Cost just effective. Wanted... Yeah, right. But <laughs> when I, I'd heard, and I heard part of the story, I'm kind of reliving it and talking with you, is I think I always wondered if someone, when I heard this, some of the band members, I mean, obviously they may have been good not on purpose of being younger and you, you you helping support them it probably didn't put as much grit to keep this a band because you were kind of supporting them you know what i'm saying like the edge of i the know what you're work. saying it feels like they you know you were really the the obviously you were the lead and like you were taking care of everything so it kind of takes out that whole teamwork like it's like yeah you know like more like rest on your laurels a little bit on that end financially because a lot of bands struggle together and you know what i mean it kind of helped keep them together uh Absolutely. I mean, what happened could have not happened if I didn't. Uh, I mean, I basically spent $80,000 on the project over a six month period of time. Uh, the, the real problem was uh, it got very exciting very quickly for everybody. Yeah. And there was a lot of partying going on, which means drugs and alcohol. Right. And so not cost effective, there, though. <laughs> no, that was not good. And, and that's that's where we parted ways. Yeah. I think what else I'm saying a little extra, I mean, because watching the videos, I mean, you guys were as good as everybody else. I mean, there really was no, you know. Thank you. I don't, you're welcome. I, I don't, I feel like maybe because you didn't have the longevity, you know, to have it, you know, in the game long enough to get picked up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Band. I think it... if they, if there was more, you know, together, sorry, togetherness with the band, everybody on the same page, and you guys push through, you know. Who knows? It was a weird dynamic. We had a manager uh, that had managed the knack uh, and they found some success. And he put me in uh, contact with Amit Erdogan while we were practicing one time. Wow. I'm on the phone with Amit Erdogan of Atlantic Records. And he's explaining that this guy I'm dealing with is a real thing. And, you know, uh, we were wow. eminently going to be signed. But the problem that I had with this particular situation, and it was a dynamic that was rather weird. You know, how often do you come across something where one person in the band spends a ton of money, and then when it, you get the record contract, it's not set up for that person to make anything more than anybody else. And I just oh. basically, I wanted my $80,000 back. Right, at least, back. Like, like a, at least a finder's <laughs> fee, we get your money back to start, and then you're even. Yeah. I uh, wasn't able to pull that together. It was, no, that's not what this is about. Uh, you know, we'll sign the band as bands are signed. But uh, no, uh, you know, you're not having a bigger piece of the pie or anything. And I, I really just wanted my money back. Uh, greedy, possibly. But but that that wasn't the reason the band folded. The reason the band folded was, as I just explained, 
this was uh, an instance where we could have been signed to a major label. Right. And I had to say, would love to, but this is why it's, you know, it's got to give me something back. So. Well, so I wouldn't say it's as good. I mean, it's, it's, that's a lot of money. And if you it is. put it in there, there's no reason why you should get that much money back. It's like, back then it's like a house. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a chunk of change to have a bunch of strangers, you know, go off of that. And at the time, though, you were also still doing your, your guitar, uh, the guitar lessons. It was starting to take uh, off, that, too, right? Oh, my guitar lessons were taking off big time. Which allows that's you how to do I, this. That's how I had the money to do it. And that is really why I did the guitar lessons in the first place. It was to, I thought that I could accumulate enough money to realize my dream of being a rock star, right? So, yeah. Uh, but no, what happened is I knew that I couldn't actually do the guitar lesson business big time and work full time with the band. Okay. So I let someone else basically take over my business while I was doing that. And that was another impetus for, oh boy my business is going to go downhill unless I get back involved. And it's a whole lot easier than this. <laughs> so <laughs> like both things are just kind of caving in on you. you you're at the top of each of them. I was yeah. working with a net. How's that? Man, I tell you, luckily you obviously your, your business kept going and, and grew and grew and grew to this point that is now. So after the band broke up and I imagine over the years, you've always written original music and you've kept doing stuff over the years, right? Yes. And, probably putting it out and recording. I don't, I haven't really gone too deep to see any original stuff. Out no, there. no, actually I haven't put, uh, and much, much out aside from a couple of things on SoundCloud, but, uh, since then I really haven't put it out. I, uh, a lot of what I do has been with my guitar lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, there are songs that I write for the guitar lessons and record them and so on and so forth, but I still write original music. As a matter of fact, even this morning, uh, before I went out and played 18 holes of golf, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was in my studio here uh, uh, recording original music, working on some things. That's pretty cool. You got to put some of it out so some young guitar player can I, copy your stuff and do it backwards for you. <laughs> uh, I am planning to put something out, um, and, and that's what my project is right now. I, you know, I have been writing for a long time, and it's fairly cohesive. Uh, I just haven't taken the time to really do high level recordings of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's my project right now. And I'm laying back from the business a little bit, especially in the summer, because the summer, uh, the guitar business, uh, guitar lesson business has been historically slow the entire time I've been uh, selling guitar lessons because really? people put their guitar in the closet in the summer and they're outside. As soon as daylight savings time changes and you get another hour of darkness or two, uh, then they start buying lessons again. So during the summer, I am spending way more time working on my own music uh, than working on the lessons. And your swing, your swing on the golf course. Oh yeah, I, I get out and I, I I play golf a couple times a week. You have to. Most rockers do play golf. It's pretty funny. It seems like <laughs> I had a thing. I had a great round today. The last twelve holes. We're, we're not going to talk about the uh, first six holes because it was pitiful. But the last 12 holes, I was one over par. So that's, uh, that's golf that's and good. the ball pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's really good. At this point, with COVID, how it changed the game a little bit? For you, has it changed a lot? Because there's a lot more people now. And not just well, COVID it, alone. Well, I'm sorry. Let me step back. Let me rephrase it. A, in the past couple of years, there's been more teachers, and there's a lot of really good ones out there. That, oh, yeah. And everyone, and, and everyone teaches on different levels, too. Like, mm -hmm. I, there's some, I can't learn off of certain people I've learned, and there's, you know, some people, other, other people I can. But to that point, as it's changed, on top of more people coming into your world, because you were, you know, one of the, the big ones, you've had more competition, and then COVID happened, and then everybody bought guitars, which was good for everybody, because there's like, guitars for everyone. Like an open wood for you. You know, guitars for everyone. But then you have a lot more people out there, and now COVID is kind of going away, with with people being allowed to go out more. Yeah, which changes the dynamic again. So I imagine you've had some. Oh, absolutely. Waters the past couple of years. Uh, uh, before COVID, it has started to slow down substa substantially, and then uh, COVID hit, and uh, yes, it's been really, really good for the guitar lesson business, and uh, it continues to do well. 
Uh, at the same time, it was crazy uh, a couple of years ago when everybody was locked in their uh, apartment or house with their guitar. Uh, and so we did real well. But yeah, that has slowed down. And as you're saying, there's so much stuff going on uh, on YouTube. And I used to criticize it. I don't anymore. Of course, there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of great stuff. I love YouTube. Uh, YouTube is a source of most of my entertainment in the evening. Have it on my TV, and I, I I watch YouTube as much as I watch anything else. And there's, yeah. like you were saying earlier, there's so much stuff from the past that's yeah. uh, uh, amazing to check out. I mean, even from like when I was a kid, things like Blind Faith. I didn't know that there was concert footage of Blind yes. Faith. Where's and this then, footage coming from? All of a sudden, I'm still still new footage of these bands from like got the Blind Faith. I know. Watching. It's still coming up. I'm like, every day I'm like, oh, watch list later. And it's most of our bands from like, you know, way back because I, I wasn't, a, you know, seeing concerts in the 60s. <laughs> I was born exactly. in 70. So, I mean, right. this is some great stuff. Yeah, it's and amazing. Shot well, who did this? Who <laughs> stuck a full size film camera like from 60s into these places? Absolutely. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, but I managed to continue to compete because of my history. A lot of people know about me from way back then. Uh, they trust me. Many of them studied my lessons. They knew that they worked. I, I have a good reputation. If I were to just come out and start lessons from scratch right now, as so many people are doing, too much competition. Yeah. And it's really hard to, you know, I'm lucky that I'm able to sell enough that it motivates me to have a nice camera and i can take the time to put the materials together but if someone's coming home and doing this after a day of work mm -hmm. they can't really compete with the type of thing i'm able to do right. because much of the time it's a full-time business for me well i think that's one thing people don't realize being a youtube creator is it takes a lot i mean i have a full-time job but this almost takes like a full-time job too because mm -hmm. you're, you're obviously you're, you're putting together your content you're, you're shooting the content, you're editing it, then you're advertising it, you're putting a word out there, you're organizing it, you're emailing it, there's there's business behind the scenes. There's a lot to do than just not you just playing guitar in front of the camera. You know? Absolutely. It's almost like everything else. When you're on a tour, you play, you're on a stage for an hour, everything else is behind the scenes is the boring stuff. You know? Well, it's part of what has kept me in this for so long because I wear many hats and a lot of the hats that I wear, I enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, promotions, I love writing. So I write newsletters, uh, I do the internet thing, love shooting YouTube videos for free, uh, like working on the lessons. There's just, you know, I have so many different things that I can do. Now, there's some things I don't like to do. The DVD market has gotten so much smaller that I am the man that the, <laughs> packages and mails DVDs. And it's really difficult to do when it's like a Tuesday and I got two orders. <laughs> I got to package these up and drive over to the post office. So and I encourage gas, everybody. Plus more. Yeah, I, I encourage everybody to buy digital downloads and streaming. It's so much better. You can watch it on all devices and the video quality is so much better than DVDs. Yet, as you can imagine, people in this age group, you know, the average age, say, is a median age is 55 or so. A lot of DVD people out there, so I do I sell. It's kind of, kind of collectors too, more of a collector's item too. Well, a lot of people like to have something physically in their hand. Some of it is collecting, I assume, um, but there are people that just I don't have a computer. Uh, I don't know how to do that, um, and my stuff now. Uh, six months ago, it wasn't great for even a phone because I wasn't doing streaming. Right. And the files are too big to download onto the phone. So you really should have a computer. Even now, if you're going to download stuff, it should go to the computer. Yet now, six months, maybe even longer, uh, I have done the streaming thing. And so that's great. Uh, available on all devices. Well, that's, that's really good. I mean, it, people don't realize how much space HD still takes up. And then HD gets bigger and bigger in different formats of it. Next thing you know, you're 20, 30, 40 gig. Oh yeah, show. I mean, it also just sucks up space like anything. I think I downloaded space servers, and you know, it's a whole other nightmare. You know, I've been doing this so long that you can imagine I've saved all the hard drives, and I've got a bin that's like that, completely full of hard drives. 
because I've done video and a lot of these uh, projects are 80 to 100 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I mean, I used to have been doing video most of my life and I, the size of the files and everything goes, I have a big stack of actually, you can't see it because I say clean, but I was moving files around just from the show and the size onto other external drives today, just making them, making room, moving them around. I got a big box of them myself. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. You just can't, you just got to keep moving them around, you know, it's, it is, it's how it goes. But I think people just don't realize the amount of work that other people do put into them on, on into a YouTube show though, you know, and it's always oh, good yeah. to, to check out, you know, I encourage you to check out your website and check out your lessons you know, and, and see if you're the right person for them because everyone looks at everyone is different. And now you have other teachers there too. But you have a nice, a nice website. And you have, you know, a nice, a nice program put together. And you know, I encourage people to check it out. Well, the great thing about my program that not many people can say is uh, I'm basically doing the same course that I did 40 years ago. But every few years, it's revised. Uh, and so it changes and part of the changes in recent history mm -hmm. has been, oh, there's an internet now for the, <laughs> where I wasn't on the internet in 94. You know, there's so many different changes in the hardware and software. It, it, it's different, but what's happened over these 40 years, I mean, initially, since there was no internet, my students contacted me either by phone, but mainly taking the time to write me letters. And over this entire period of time, I have the privilege of knowing what they want to learn and what hasn't worked in my course. Mm -hmm. So I can revise it. Uh, if they're not understanding, I'm able to change that. And I also think about this stuff all the time. How can I do a better job of explaining it than I have over the past 40 years. But I have this vast history and I don't think that that should be discounted. It's, yeah. it's like people became rock stars by studying my stuff on audio cassette. Uh, yeah, I have some amazing testimonials from great players that learned way back then on audio cassette. So of course video is better, but everything that we've got now as far as, uh, I use a, a program with my course called Guitar Pro that has animated tab that you can play along with. These things weren't available before. So uh, as times have changed, my course has changed, but all along I have been responding to my students' questions. And right now it's great that I can post something on YouTube and I have the feedback instantly. Oh, yeah. Is this working? I think the last thing is probably going to be, is going to be the, uh, the Doug Marks on the hologram. That's probably going to be the last technology thing for you. <laughs> we can do the Star Wars Obi-Wan. You can zoom into their rooms. They can watch you play right with them. <laughs> I am Doug Marks, back the from the grave. I am here to teach you a lesson. You can, shred, you can shred right in their room. It'd be kind of funny. Yeah, great. <laughs> that would be a last piece of technology for you, right? And you go live for eternity. But I, I want to thank you. Um, I want to look, I'm going to look for your, your album. Hopefully it'll come out soon. Probably next year, too, right? You, you know, so you're really working hard on it. I'm you're working right hard on it. Yeah. I, I don't have a deadline, so you know how that goes. <laughs> Without a deadline, it can take forever. Uh, when I did my last album, I did the same thing. I advertised it, said it's ready. It wasn't ready. My students motivated me to finish the album. Um, maybe, maybe I should take sorry, that time. So people look for his album next year at the same time. It's going to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Eric, it's out Thanks. there. In, it's out there in the YouTube the... world now. So this is it. We're yeah. looking for you. I'll be looking forward to talking to you next year. We'll be talking about your new album. We'll have you back and we'll do your album. But okay, no, seriously, good. people, check out, check them out. Check out the album. Uh, the album. <laughs> check out the website and all this stuff. And, and, you, and you have some really good teachers, too. And obviously, Michael is, is insane. So I, yeah. I want to thank you for being on the show, man. Hey, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too.